Hello, and welcome to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity, integrity Deficit Disorder. Today, we have Ptolemy Pruden, author, naval person to the bone. <laughs> he's, he's got a lot of that, I'll tell you. We, we're going to talk all, um, all about it. That's what we're going to find out today. And um, let me start out, uh, Ptolemy. You've got the, uh, the book. It's in the makings. It's going to be said a few weeks. Yes, I, yes, I do. Uh, thank you, John. I, I appreciate you inviting me to your program today. Um, sure. So, yes, um, the, the book is named China Rising, The Case for Containment. Actually, I have a copy right here. You can get a copy called the China Rising Book dot com, the China Rising Book dot com. And uh, it took me six years to write it. And so it's 400 pages and 50 pages of citations. <laughs> only only six. <laughs> when, yeah, I, well, when, I, when I did my memoir, it took me 30 years. <laughs> okay, so you got me there. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you some questions. Things here, I, I would assume that you had a, a, an ear to the to the TV and radio in the last week or so with uh, Chi coming in to see, uh, I don't know what to call him, Biden. Um, yeah. You know, but, uh, so what did you think about all that? Have you heard did you, any information you come out of that? Yes. I, I mean, I, so I've been an avid watcher primarily of China's military. I think that they spend close to about six hundred six hundred billion dollars a year on their on their defense establishment. And for for the Chinese, they include their Navy, the Air Force, the Marines, but also their Coast Guard and internal security. So they have a whole lot more involved in their uh, in their budget for their national defense. Um, so you have to look at all the pieces when you look at China. But they have had a very high a youth unemployment rate for the last three to four years, ever since after uh, uh, the pandemic uh, concluded. And so their economy is tanking. Everyone is decoupling, which I'm a proponent of decoupling from China. And so they are in a situation where they need to get, get finances coming back into the country. And so everything has been micromanaged by Xi Jinping. And so now he wants to come back in and get more money so they to compensate for um, how he's been operating the country for the last uh, five five to ten years sounds to me he wants his money back from that he paid under the, under the covers <laughs> well okay so let's look at that so that was, that was good <laughs> so i think you're, you're looking at the the trade debt you're looking at unfair business practices you're looking at them them raiding corporate uh corporations there u.s corporations there in china you're looking at um how they have uh pegged the, the wand to the dollar you look at all these different things that the that the uh, prc has done in, in, in intellectual property. And so you're looking at a situation where they have to be turned back from what they're doing, not in, in strengthened and encouraged to do more of it. And so I am not a proponent in any capacity of helping the economy to grow any more than maybe two and a half to three percent. I think if so they can stay up, stay um stay um, val um valuable as a fiscal uh entity yes but I don't and I don't want them to go into depression but we right. don't need China having so much power that they're able to build their their military to a point where it comes like it causes a problem for us five years and ten years down the road and so it's a econ economic warfare takes decades and so they we have invested uh 12 to 20 trillion dollars in the Chinese economy and through through um through the last three decades and so now we're in a situation where um we just got to tune it down so that they can survive but not thrive to the level they're building their military up to the, to be a threat to us right right um what's the name of the woman who runs the treasury yellen janet janet yellen what do you think about that well i mean i think J janet yellen i mean okay so first of all john i'm an independent so i'm not a democrat or i'm a republican not a republican i'm an independent kind of trying to keep it down the middle of the road for very major and obvious reasons, because I, I feel that I have a lot to do nationally and globally, and I think I can do more being independent than anything else. But Janet Yellen, I think, has had a tough job trying to keep things moving and kind of pushing our, our country so that we don't go into um, economic stagnation as it relates to our deficit with with um, with uh, trade debt, 
with China. And, and, they, and actually, in the last three three months, the trade debt has been a, pl a plus, meaning we spent more with Mexico than we did with with um, with uh, China. So that, I think that's a great thing. I'd rather in increase the capability of Mexico and, and Canada than China any day of the week because they're not trying to blow us up or trying to maneuver on us politically or geopolitically. Um, so Janet Yellen is kind of maneuvering through all that. And um, I mean, look, when you look at uh, the, the, the trillions of dollars we spent in, in growing our, our um, inflation rate and all the money that we're losing there. So there's a big job that she has. So, you know, I, I, you got to look at it from different. I look at her job from a global perspective as it relates to America's um, strength and what we have to do geopolitically and making sure that we're able to keep our friends and allies strengthened. So I'm not looking at just from a domestic political perspective, but global global operations perspective. Well, you've got a, a very good uh, uh, view of that, I would say, the adding to it, but then doing or being what you do, that probably fits right in the, in the, in the mill. Yes. Okay. So for me, I want everyday Americans to be able to be a part of that national conversation. I want mm -hmm. everyday Americans to be a part of the national defense uh, conversation. So our NDA, the National Defense Authorization Act, is about $860, $880 billion per annum. Um, and that's going to grow up. And in a couple of years, it'll be a trillion dollars per year. So our GDP overall is close to $30 trillion. So, um, so what, what's going to happen is the everyday American needs to understand how that money is being spent and to make sure that we're not wasting money. I don't. I want us to invest more into our national defense infrastructure uh, and but I, and the capabilities, but I don't want us just to waste money. It's just that's when those days are over. We, you know, you look at um, the last decade and a half, the the Navy spent about wasted about a hundred billion dollars um, on on failed projects. Whether it's a littoral combat ship, whether it's the um, whether it's a Zumwalt cruiser, or whether it's an extra four, five, six billion dollars on the Ford car carrier, which is a beautiful carrier. I've been on it. It's a beautiful carrier, but just how things are managed. Um, but they've just wasted a lot of money. I'm not in favor of that. I'd rather build more, more weapon systems and better ships. But I don't want to waste the money. You see what I'm saying? So that's kind of. Um, so for me, you need money to all, to do all that. And with our uh, with our podcast called the Common Sense Defense Podcast, with the Common Sense Defense Podcast, our goal has been to have a campaign called Build Our Navy. And that's where we want people to call Congress to put $15 billion more into the shipbuilding fund. And so we've been dealing with that over the last year as well. And I'll be doing that to next year as well. Great. Great. Uh, I was listening to some um, uh, debate. I call it debate on TV. Uh -huh. And what they were debating on was the uh, the southern border okay. uh, of the U.S., and they had a number on the number of people that are, were actually Chinese men, um, military type men. And uh, it was pretty scary. I, th I shook my head. I think they said 57,000 mm -hmm. of Chinese had gotten through. Okay, How do so, we fix that? Okay, so for me, and this is, I'm not being xenophobic. My biggest concern is not the Chinese men coming in from the border illegally from Mexico. It's right. more or more the people who are in our labs and the students that we train, 280,000, 235,000 students, Chinese students that we train every year in advanced physics and advanced technology that go back to China and strengthen their mil military industrial complex for weapon systems coming back to our children four years from now. 10 years from now. So, you know, as long as those people coming across the border, it's all bad, but yeah. I, as long, if they're not, if they're not coming in to, to, uh, to, to, with weapons, physical weapons, then that's one component. But the other is the intellectual weapon, uh, John, that we have to look at where that weakness is in our, in our, our research and development system. So whether it's, it, whether it is, um, through the colleges, whether it's through the different types of research capabilities we have in advanced companies, uh, technologies that are that are being traded, that are being stolen and sent back, all those things I'm looking at. And to me, we have a big gaping hole that we need to make sure we cover that up. And I think to a certain extent over the last, I think some of the Trump era things, some of the things even Biden ha has done over the last uh, few months have started sealing that wall off because we are starting to realize, man, so much information has gone back to China. So much important uh, intellectual capital has, has, has been stolen or has been taken to China. And so therefore we have a situation that 
we got to make sure that that stopped. And so I think there that's the conversation that's going to take us at least three or four years to to start kind of working, with, especially since we're dealing with um, AI, quantum computing, all these things that have a direct military capability that we need to be cognizant of. So, so yes, we need to stop them coming in across the border, but we've got problems right in our in our universities, in our labs, in our advanced companies that that information is being shipped right out the door. Right. No, no bueno. Um, <laughs> uh, they were talking too with about the, the drugs. The yes. one, yeah. How does that fit in besides killing well, our peoples? OK, John, this is okay, this is a dear thing to, to me, because you, you look at 80,000, 75 to 80,000 people in our country are dying every year through drug overdose. And, and it's through fentanyl and, and the, the precursors to the fentanyl are made there in, yeah. in China and they're shipped here. But, John, let me tell you this. And this is no one's thinking about this. But 300 years ago, during the opium war, we shipped stuff to China to destroy and make that country just stop. So to me. And that and for a decade, they they were out of capability. They the, the people were, were they were doing just like we're doing now. They were dying and incapable of operating and working. So I think that China is allowing this to come our way to get us back. And no one is talking about this, but the reality is, I think they're trying to get us back for what happened 200 years ago. And so um, and I think that they're not making it a top priority. Look, a hundred. Can you imagine you you have created the ability for 75,000 American people to die, and not just. I mean, and the youngest people, the people who have the greatest capability for their future, dying at 15, 25, 30, 35, 40, younger, dying. And so, and and not being penalized from a military perspective at all. Now, I'm not I'm not saying that we should go to, to war over it. I'm saying that it needs to be addressed. And I'm also saying that I feel that they are not addressing it because they're looking back to the opium war, one, the second opium war, and where they, where we, along with Britain and a couple other countries, work to keep, to keep, keep uh, China suppressed through drug trade. Right, right. I think when uh, they concentrate on doing that, uh, they're, they're, of course, they're building uh, the number of Democrats and uh, versus Republicans. Um, so it does get political as to how many. Uh, people come in the the back door. You know, it's uh, it's it's hard to see. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the, the natural immigration process should be adhered to. I think that the policies have to be adjusted some across the board for for reasons I really don't really want to go into here. But I mean, I think that people come into our country for opportunity. I think they typically don't come to the country to destroy the country or disassemble the country. Um, I think there are bad actors that do come in. Um, I feel that um, that we have to understand that. But I also feel that one of the things that we should do as a nation is really to help Mexico and help Latin America where they have more opportunity there. And if we are made it possible for Mexico and Latin America to have more opportunity, then people have be less likely to want to come here into our country. So there's another conversation. I, want, I mean, but that's kind of where my policy perspective is that we can't. We, yes, we do need to build a wall. I think everybody wants to build a wall. Um, but we also have to look at the root cause of what we're dealing with. And the root cause is they don't have an opportunity in Mexico and in Latin America, in Guatemala, Costa Rica. All, you know, there's no opportunity. Um, so right. how do we fix that? You know, and look, John, we we caused a whole lot of problems back in the 60s and 70s in Latin America with the School of the Americas and all those days. I and mean, we caused a lot of problems. And so no one wants to touch fixing South America, uh, fixing Latin America. No one wants to bother that. But we got to find some way that we can make uh, make more opportunity there in Latin America so that they can have a successful future and want to stay there in their own home country. Well, I would think so. Uh, I know there's a lot of debate going on with that, but they're all wringing their hands. I would say they should. Uh, the other people that are in Congress, the other people will ultimately uh, get into action and hopefully uh, we'll get it done. Uh, we just don't know yet. It's, uh, uh, what we, do you we've think got it. We got to So we have to. OK, so we have to grow our economy. So we're twenty eight trillion 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 dollars, twenty nine trillion dollars, depending on how this growth we're four percent growth over the last quarter, four and a quarter, whatever. And so we're looking good as far as our growth. But, you know, you look at Canada, their GDP is of two and a quarter trillion and, and Mexico's one and one and one point seven trillion dollars. Both Canada and Mexico, their GDPs need to grow. And, and, and here's why I say that we have to start looking at. Um, economic growth and development, not just from a United States perspective, but from a North American perspective. And we're not going to go to war with Canada. We're not going to go to war with Mexico. These are family and friends. 
how do we get them where they're more realistic and re reliable and stronger trading partners? And so whether it's friend shoring, near shoring, it doesn't matter to me pulling the money from, from, from China and putting it in Mexico. I'm totally cool with that. Putting more money into Canada if we can, I'm cool with that. So I think our goal should be how do we grow the Mexican economy to a $2 trillion, $2.5 trillion? How do we grow the Canadian economy? How do we, and, and not losing it from ourselves, but how do we grow their economy? And I think foreign direct investment is a way to do it, and 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 moving some of our production from from um, China to to Mexico that we can, or obviously as you know we're moving it to to uh, to India and Malaysia and the Philippines. But I think that that as well. But we got to look at how we can strengthen our our, our um, uh, North American continent economically. Right now, you follow the the uh, the Navy. Yeah, <laughs> is, that, is that where you floated for a while? So, okay. So yes. So, uh, so, the, so yes, you're right. So the Navy is my, uh, is the military is, is my strength and the focal right now, focal point is Navy. So, um, so for, for 30 years, I studied foreign affairs and weapon systems. And so, um, I am, I'm outside the beltway guy. And I think that is a strength of why I'm capable of doing everyone's interested in what I'm talking about is because I'm from outside the beltway and not been part of the CIA for or for for 30 years or the DOD or anything like that. Right. Everything mm -hmm. I've learned has been self-taught. And and the reason it's important to everyone else is because everyone else in America can do the exact same thing to be up to speed so that they can have their part to play in our in the, the national defense for our, for our country and have a voice there. And I think that's kind of the strength of what I'm doing is like, hey, if I can do it, somebody else can do the exact same thing. Um, so now mm -hmm. the Navy needs a lot of capability, they need a lot more money, and we have to make it possible for one, to modify the processes in place that so that they can get better in uh, the maintenance for their ships, our ships, so we can get better in building ships more, uh, building ships more uh, effectively. And so how do you do that so that you can build the Navy and grow the Navy? So we only have four major public shipyards and we, we only have three or four, five Navy uh, primes, primary builders. For this general dynamics, electric bolt, Huntington Ingalls, a stall, you know, so there's only a few major builders. And so we have to increase the capacity for our Navy so that we can build more platforms. And the very first thing before we do any of that, we need to stop decommissioning ships, John. We decommission like 10 to 12 ships every year. We only have 290 ships. We are decommissioning ships. It takes five years to, from cut, first cutting your steel to rolling out a new ship. It takes five years to get one out and back on an ocean. So when you're cutting back all your ships, right. you're going to have a problem. And so seven, 2027, we're projected to have 285 ships. China's projected to have 400 ships. So we have a very big problem with with that and so how do you fix it so the whole the whole concept is we need to first stop decommissioning ships two we need to pour about five to six billion dollars per year into the maintenance of the ships that we have so they don't sit in port for four years before you even get to get to the dry dock and then after we are able to get the maintenance up and going correctly then obviously we're going to expand the capacity for our shipbuilding for our surface ships and definitely for our sun submarine industrial base they need billions of dollars you know from AUKUS to our own pl platforms that we need to to grow that we have a lot of capability there if we spend the money on it what do you what's your view on uh, training and uh and coming in and putting on a uniform Okay, so training for the Navy, training for the military, training for the industrial base, training for what what type of training are we talking about? Uh, let's see. When I came back from Nam, mm -hmm. I ended up with a uh, a um, <laughs> I was a teacher because okay. I was I was a hit drill sergeant, and <laughs> uh, I was the honor graduate of my drill sergeant school. And those kind of things are small, but they, you know, they they, they start, and they're smart. Uh, but people aren't uh, enthusiastic about uh, because one of the uh, enrollments volunteers is not what it ought to be. Yes. Okay. Got you. Yes. So I think that okay. So we have a problem endemically across our nation. One of that is getting younger people right. to want to want want to work. So that's yeah. that's the first thing is getting them to work. Um, and that the the Navy has the exact same problem as the Air Force, and Marines, uh, Space Space Force, probably too. Everyone has a problem getting kids 
uh, to get into the get into the job of the military or to work with the, their profession. Um, right. So we're going to have to uh, incentivize them. I mean, we're going we're to have to make it where of that pool of young people that, that come in every year. And I think that I think every almost everybody's down three or four uh, percent. We've got to get that pool where our numbers up. Now, John, a couple of things are going to happen. First of all, automation is going to reduce the workload and also robotics are going to, but that's not going to be for another 10 to 12 years, 15 years, where those things probably come in and you start seeing a difference. And I think the Army and the Marines will see that difference before the Navy. Well, no, that's not true. The Army and the Marines will see that first, then you'll see it in the Navy, and you'll see it in the Air Force, unmanned platforms, drones, you know, um, and so mm -hmm. I'm a proponent of man in the loop, meaning I don't feel that we should at all have an armed unmanned vehicle in the South China Sea or in the Eastern, uh, in, in the Philippine Sea, anywhere near China, unmanned should never be there. It should, a, a unmanned armed platform should not be there. Um, it should always be manned because if you have a human being, we know what we're doing. It's on us if we make a mistake. If a whale hits it or if it hits the side of something and starts shooting, then you have a war that is started by our, our machine. Um, so the point is that we have to get our, our, our forces equipped to do the job. And so we need to make, give them more incentive to come and join the Navy or the Air Force and military and, and overall. So we need to incentivize them. So which means they have extra, take the signing bonuses up, get get them a car, you know, different things we have to do. And we don't have to do for maybe what, four or five years. After about four or five years, we're not going to worry about it because those numbers are going to start coming down because those platforms are going to be reduced with automation. That's like everything else. It's automation is going to be taken over the military as well. Right, right. I wonder to what extent those people that are in charge of that really, really work at it. Really, uh, I have no reason not to really see it, but it's just sometimes I just wonder. Yeah, I, I, I wonder too. I don't. I think I'm, I think they're depending on automation too much. Personally, I, me personally, I like having human beings in the mix. Now, when it comes down to war, I, my policy is to replace the machines with men replace the men with machines um so um so that they can do the to do the next phase of fighting the first phase of fighting okay. is human human to human meaning okay we know for sure that you're fighting there's no mistake there's no error now that we know we have a real war here replace those people with unmanned aircraft unmanned v surface vehicles and unmanned drones and all the missiles and torpedoes and all the weapon systems that you can find to to get the enemy contained and then after that juncture, then you look your follow-on forces will obviously be manned and unmanned hybrids. Um, and, and the reason for that is because if you can get an adversary understanding, man, we're gonna get our butts beat here, let's stop fighting. So if you can get to that phase faster, then you reduce the length of your conflict. And so and that's really conflict in the future was particularly high-end conflict with like China, United States. The right. that that level of conflict is gonna be quick. It won't be a three hour, I mean a three week or three month war. But because there's too much involved and no one wants to go nuclear. So the reality is that conflict is going to be solved in the first three to five days. It will be over with. Well, that's good news. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my best friend is um, who is overweight. I hope he's listening. Um, <laughs> he, he was Navy. OK. And his time was spent on a carrier. OK. And apparently he was in certain parts of the, uh, the water close enough to Vietnam about filing for Agent Orange. And, uh, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. So they're still working on that. For the filing for Agent Orange? I mean, you know, every war has its horrors and every war has its um, contaminants. And... Right. The Vietnam contaminant with Agent Orange, the Gulf War was the Gulf War syndrome, where they was all the oil burning uh, contaminated the guys' suits and uniforms, causing them to be sick and die when they came back. Then you have the open burn pits that we deal with Afghanistan. You have the different um, other types of uh, um, ailments and issues that the gentlemen, men and women, have gone through. Um, and so every everyone, there's always some type of some type of dearth that they're dealing with. And now we have an incredibly high suicide rate. I think to the tune of two to four people uh, are dying by yeah. suicide every day. That is just, a, that's terrible. Um, yeah. Especially, you know, it's like a war that doesn't stop. And, and it's the most sad, it's the saddest thing. And and I think that, that that issue has to be, it should be a national issue that we do. Because these ladies and gentlemen have served for their country. 
They have fought for our country. They have put their lives on the line and, and, and they're not getting the care or not going to the care that they need. So the question is why and what can we do to get that, get them the care they need so they can keep living? They're young. They got a long life to live. Let's make it possible for them to live a long life. Right. You know, I, I grade the VA and I give them an A, a plus. Um, that is, that's awesome. Yeah. That is really awesome, especially over the last, you know, as we've gone through the different challenges the VA has had, has had to go through. Um, and, and, and so the correction. So what you're saying to me is your experience has been uh, has, you've, you've experienced a corrective measure where things have gotten somewhat better. Yeah, they, want, that, they, yeah. they want to be somebody's managing it now. That, that makes sense. That's good. One was That's... in San, San Antonio. Uh, Audie Murphy uh, okay. is there. Um, and then here in. Tucson, Tucson, Arizona. Uh, yeah. They all are, they've been retrained, I think. Uh, and, I, and I've watched it happen and it's good. That's beautiful. That's, that really makes me feel good. I mean, I think that um, anyone who, who, who puts a uniform on and, 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 and makes an oath to detect, to protect our nation, there's somebody that the nation should always protect and look after. It's just the reality. And it's not about, uh, whether you're in for six years or or 30 years, or it is about the fact that you served and that you put yourself in a situation where you were could, to serve our nation, you should always be taken care of. It's just the reality of it. Absolutely the reality of it. Tell me we're so glad you had took the time to spread all that knowledge on us. Uh, I'm, I'm at home doing, you know, doing this. So good. <laughs> <laughs> you're too kind of that. Uh, uh, it uh, you know it's good because our listeners need to hear some some things like you have, and of course I do as well. That's why we call it searching for integrity. That's, and that's a beautiful title. Love it. And I, and I thank you very much for being our guest today, and uh, so long, and happy trails to all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And remember the China Rising book.com. And I'll look forward to talking to you and, and getting some more information to you, John, for, for when we do the book release. Great. I appreciate that.